Welcome to our last Youth Research Dialogue in 2021. This is the fourth episode of our thematic online series of evidence-based youth research findings. I'm Carmen Teubel. I'm managing and coordinating the European Youth Research Network, RAE, um, which is based at the Finnish National Agency for Education. The network itself consists of or involves 32 partners in currently 34 European countries and a partner is always a national agency for the European youth programs as well as a national research partner. Yeah, at the moment the RAIN network is conducting nine research projects and one of our thematic research project which started in 2019 um, deals with the, with the role of innovation in European youth work. The initial uh, research focused on the impact of Key Action 2 in the Erasmus Plus Youth Program, so on the strategic partnerships and corporations on innovation. And as a follow-up to, to this conducted research, the RAIN network decided that, yeah, to want or decided to look a bit further or a bit beyond this and to investigate also which types and kinds of innovation are needed for, yeah, for which aspects of European youth work. So today's topic is the role of innovation in European youth work and youth policy with the guiding question, what is needed? And you will hear an input from uh, our mentioned Ray Research Project from Andreas Kasten, a member of the Ray Transnational Research Team. We are also very happy to be joined today by two guest speakers, uh, Federica De Micheli and Dragan Atanasov. They will present and discuss the um, outcomes of their recent study on innovation, which was conducted in the framework of the European Academy on Youth Work. You will hear more about them in a second. The moderation is done as always by Tomi Kilakowski and Toma Goemoric. So yeah, from my side, thank you already for joining. Um, I'm also happy to share with you that we will continue this online series uh, next year. So check out our Ray website and related social media pages for any updates. And yeah, we will be glad if you would join us in 2022 when we will be when we will discussing new topics um, uh, in relation to youth research and youth policy. Enjoy this dialogue and all the best for the new year. And now to you, Tommy. Thank you, Carmen. And thank you, everyone in the audience, and welcome to the fourth Youth Research Dialogue. Our topic today is innovation, which is a concept, and some would say a password, that has been and is still widely used in different policy documents. Innovation is also seen as a driver for the competitiveness of Europe in the global, global, global economy. And then think about innovation, they think about something that is beneficial for all of us. And therefore, it is not surprising that it's really easy to find examples stating the need to be innovative. Uh, and this is the case also in, uh, in the youth field. The final declaration of the third, third Youth Work Convention, which was held roughly a year ago and was a large gathering of European Youth Work community, uh, had a declaration which stated this. It said that we should always be striving towards the maintenance of the good structures and practices that already exist, their development when the need arises, and the space for innovation in our thinking, our organization, and our practices. And of course, innovation is also mentioned in the EU youth strategy. So it is, it is widely held to be valuable to different fields. However, despite the widely held, held emphasis on inno innovation, there have been skeptical voices in the youth field, reminding us that sometimes innovation is narrowly seen as a technological innovation or and uh, commercialized innovation. So to better understand innovation in youth work, one needs to pay attention to unique features of youth work and what conditions support innovation in youth work. 
to the will approach the topic with two speakers uh, who present us the findings of their studies and then we will have Drakan join us so we have three guests all together. Uh, our dialogue will be recorded and the live stream will be available afterwards. Uh, I invite you to ask, uh, ask questions and please comment on the discussion on the Facebook and you can also ask questions on the Mentimeter. The code is displayed on the screen, screen, uh, screen at the moment. So without further ado, it's time to introduce our first speaker. Uh, she's Federica Demicelli, who is a trainer and an expert in youth work and youth policy with a special focus on the recognition of youth work, non-formal learning and volunteering, as well as vice president of Italian National Association of Youth Workers. Federica has over 20 years of experience in international youth work projects, especially within SALTMET cooperation. She will be presenting and discussing the main outcomes of the research innovation in youth work. This study was conducted in the framework of European, European Academy on Youth Work together with Rakan Atanashov, who, who is with us today, and Michelangelo Belletti. Uh, please, floor is yours, Federica. Thank you very much for the presentation and thank you very much for uh, allowing us to, to present and to share with you the first result of the research that will be uh, soon available uh, so for further discussion. Uh, so as you said, uh, this uh, research has been conducted in the Frame European Academy on Youth Work and the idea was exactly to explore a bit uh, what is uh, the definition of innovation youth work and some of the conditions that are supporting or hinder innovation in youth work. We can have a look to the definition and uh, more or less our uh, presentation will focus on this definition because it's a little bit the core of our understanding that we wanted to share with you today. Is as innovation in youth work, of course, in the field of this study, we understand methodologies, practice, tools, ways of approach, diverse target group or organizational model that has novel elements that are upgrading existing practices or completely new to the youth field or to a particular context. But, and then this is very important, to enable youth work to better address the needs of young people, positive impact on their life and on contribute to a wider social change. And we are going now to have a look to different components of this uh, definition. First of all, we focus on methodology, but not only. Uh, what we is very important for us to have an holistic approach when we think about innovation. So it's not only methodologies, practice, tools, way of approaches, target groups and organizational models, but it also the competence and the capacity to build upon practices from other sectors. As Tommy said, innovation is a, is a wider and well-spread concept that we have investigated in our research and would be very important to be able to build upon practice from other sectors, adapt and apply to the youth field. This will be a, risk, uh, a richness. But also is the capacity of innovation is the capacity when new ideas are turned into actual output. We discussed it a lot in our research about the difference between between being creative, so able to use imagination and creating uh, thinking skills to create something new that is part of the process of starting innovation process, but also the um, possibility, the capability to turn uh, ideas in something that uh, are sustainable. And there are other two main points that we want to, disc to present you. First of all, in our research, we focus a lot about organizational framework as a support of innovation. This is very important because the study showed that innovation in youth work is innovator driven with youth worker and young people being the main innovators for sure. But to the other side, it's very important strong, that innovation is strongly dependent on the action of many interrelated stakeholders. Innovation in youth work requires the support of whole system to be sustainable and successful. And moreover, innovation needs to have replication potential. 
Uh, and this is very important in terms of creating quality in our field and being able to stronger experience and transferring. Especially because there is, in the research we had the possibility to analyze another gap that was identified between innovation in youth field and what is happening in other sectors. Uh, we always speak about the importance to have intersection or intersectorial approaches, but it's not easy. And more measures should be taken to promote the collaboration and exchange of ideas between the youth field and other sectors. This is particularly important in smaller community, where according to the responses that uh, we had in our research, there is less influence between the different sectors. And for uh, just uh, giving the last uh, few words about this presentation, the last slide <laughs> that we can move. This is for us was very important. Innovation in youth work should be concentrated on creating value as much as producing novelty in novelty in two sense. That for us in this research was important to see as uh, for the youth field, youth work and uh, innovation is value based and has an important, in the sense, making social change. Um, there was, uh, when we started this, the research, uh, some of the youth workers, they were saying that sometimes you, we apply to, we apply, we reply to some of the grants and we do understand that innovation is not just, not just for doing innovation. Huh? It's not something just fashionable, but innovation should have a meaning in our uh, social community, for example, or to create um, social change. And I think this is very important to have a couple of reflection about the value dimension and the participation of young people as an active agency. The process of innovation are quite unique characteristic of innovation in youth work. And in addition, according to this definition and to the work that has been done, innovation in youth work is context specific. And this for us is another very important thing. When we speak about transferability, adaptability, or the concept of innovation, is that it's context specific. And this we know very well, huh? working in the field, can diverse in scope and involve a variety of stakeholders. And this is also capacity to develop this uh, approach. Both the process of innovation and the product are important. Hmm? So I think this is very, so important for us, uh, focusing on the process and, and focusing on the product. Some of, during the focus group that we did, some of the work was also referring to this, you know, that sometimes the innovation, we started innovation, we started a process that was innovative per se, and the outcome was an outcome. But what has been very interesting was to engage in a diverse way the young people to involve new stakeholders and to think about diverse and innovative way to work together. So this is from our side briefly some uh, of the inside of the research that we had uh, that will be quite uh, soon ready and published in the website of the Youth Work Academy. Uh, also with some uh, podcasts and also in videos that will illustrate more the outcomes. And we, with Dragon, we are uh, available for further discussion in this, this dialogue together. Thank you, Federica. <clears throat> it's time for our second presenter who has been with us in these dialogues for for three times, I think. Uh, he's Andreas Karsten, who works for the Youth Policy Labs, which is a small research ag agency and think tank in the youth sector. Andreas leads an international team of participatory research, public policy, and open data uh, aficionados. He also works on transnational research with the RAI Network for the research based analysis of European youth programs. Andreas will speak about the RAI Research Project on Innovation in Europe. Uh, and precisely in, in, in European youth work with a special focus on areas where innovation is needed. Have a go, Andreas. Thank you, Tommy, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, shout outs to everyone who is as tired as I am, just as we are heading into the last pre-Christmas frenzy. 
Um, I want to take five minutes or so to talk about um, innovation needs that we have um, uh, covered and researched in our work on innovation, as well as our other research projects that are very closely connected to that, our big monitoring series, our work on competence development and capacity building in the youth sector, um, and other research projects. So I have five of these um, with me today, and we'll go ahead and start with the first one. Um, so the first need um, uh, centers around uh, taking non-formal pedagogy and non-formal education and learning principles into online environments and to develop um, a digital non-formal pedagogy, something that despite the boost of digitalization that we have seen during the past 18 months, fueled by and framed by the pandemic, uh, we haven't yet uh, been able to do as a sector. We have more and more puzzle pieces, but putting together the puzzle into a coherent and consistent digital non-formal pedagogy that takes the principles of non-formal learning and translates them well into digital formats um, and if necessary also invents digital formats that make non-formal education really distinct in online spaces. That is something that we are still missing and uh, very much a need um, for the entire sector to, uh, to address and a need for innovation definitely and very much in the sense that Federica has just described um, novelty that not only improves youth work and non-formal education in youth work, but also improves the impact of youth work on young people. So that's the first one, digital non-formal pedagogy. And before I proceed, uh, let me just say a big shout out to Daria Rüttimann, the illustrator who has uh, done all the illustrations you will see on these slides. So the second need, um, centers around uh, dialogue with policy. Um, this is something that we have been trying for a long time in the youth field and uh, we even have in the European Youth Programme Erasmus Plus Youth um, a special format that has already existed in the previous uh, generation of the programmes, Youth Dialogue, previously called um, uh, uh, um, the Dialogue with Policymakers. And, um, and what we have seen in these specific projects as well as in many others that try to include dialogue with policymakers at some level or some form is that hardly ever does it work well. Very often policymakers are involved only as an addressee of recommendations, but not in the entire projects. A participation of policymakers is often fragile or absent. Um, and this is a, an area that we need to rethink from scratch because the way that we organize policymaking um, uh, the way we organize policymaking uh, dialogue at the moment largely doesn't work and is a second area in which our sector, our field needs innovation. Um, the third one um, centers around career development for youth workers, youth trainers, um, youth researchers, youth policymakers, people working in administrations around, um, around our field and around the issues in our field. Um, because we have generally been very good at providing entry points for people who are new to our field or new to non-formal education, youth work, um, no matter at which age they come in, whether they come from formal education later in their career, whether they come through youth organizations very, very early in their career, that is something that we have covered well. But then to continue developing careers and allowing people to stay in the sector and also allowing people to develop a career that allows them to earn a living in the sector. That is something that we have been notoriously bad at as a field. Um, we have seen that um, more experienced youth workers, for example, are largely dissatisfied with the training offers that the European youth programs make them much more than younger um, and uh, newer colleagues are. So that is, again, a third need for innovation that we see from our research work is to develop more diverse and more advanced career paths and career development opportunities. The fourth one um, centers around transnational support and what we mean here specifically is that um, we need to find new ways in which countries um, and regions um, that have a stronger youth work structure and a stronger youth work backing um, and a more developed youth work field and um, 
in some cases also relatively stable funding for youth work at local, regional, national level, that we need to start start to develop support patterns for countries and regions and youth work structures where that is not the case and that it is very very important to demand policy attention to that issue and for these weaker structures to receive adequate support from policy and programming at regional and national level but that we can't necessarily wait all the time for that and that we need to start thinking more in how we design projects and how we implement projects how can we in each and everything that we do support the structural um, elements of a weaker and less well-funded and less well-developed youth work structures across Europe. That's the fourth need that we have seen. And the fifth and final one, we have seen more in our research, but for um, this pr very quick presentation and the youth research dialogue, the, the most fundamental one is really that we need to take seriously the need for innovation and how we create conditions for innovation. Um, one big aspect that we've been talking about in this field for a very, very long time is that we need to walk away from exclusively project funding um, of European and international youth work and that we need to get better at providing structural and stable funding for youth work structures also in European and international youth work. And that we need to build seriously good spaces for failure, which this kind of project funding very often presents, but that's not the only issue here. We need to develop spaces where we can in earnest fail and also say so, where we can say, we have tried that and it didn't work that way, but now at least we know that. So let's try something else. And these safe spaces for failure, we are lacking seriously in European youth work and European youth policy making. So that is the fifth and final um, need for innovation that we have seen uh, in and from our research. And with that, thank you very much. And back to Tommy. Thank you, Federica. Thank you, Andres, for your wonderful presentations. It's time to start the dialogue part. And we will invite Drakan Atanasov with us. Drakan is a bit of a human Swiss uh, army knife. He's a trainer, he's a researcher, he's an evaluator, and he's an author who specializes in youth work, recognition, youth policy, cultural diversity, and community development. And Drakan has over 10 years of experience in, in conducting research and assessments in the field of youth work and other, other related fields. So <clears throat> we are glad that you can join us, uh, Rakan. The first question goes to you. In your report, you talk about triggers that support innovation in youth work. Can, uh, can you highlight what you have seen as key triggers of innovation in, in our field? Sure, thank you very much, Tommy, for the introduction and for that uh, very important question. So indeed, we are talking about different triggers uh, in our report, and uh, that was actually one of our questions in the survey that we conducted with a um, group of youth workers, as Federica explained earlier. And the question was, from all the different triggers, which are the ones that are the most important for um, the process of innovation? Uh, first of all, we divided the triggers into three levels. So we spoke about individual level triggers, and then organizational level, and the contextual triggers. And what the survey results showed was that the most important trigger has to do with the uh, community needs, such as the needs of young people. So when a youth worker would identify unmet community or individual needs, such as the needs of young people. And then the other triggers had to do with the youth workers themselves, uh, meaning the desire of the youth worker to create something new or just having a new idea, thinking of something uh, new or, or uh, doing something in a different way. Uh, and then a few other triggers that, again, had to do with the context with the society, such as uh, social changes, social developments, crisis, unexpected events, uh, such as the COVID-19 pandemic. Surprisingly a bit, the organizational level triggers uh, were um, quite low uh, when compared to the others, which led us to the conclusion that innovation in youth work is most often triggered by the youth workers themselves, so that it's driven by youth workers uh, and that it is often responding to emerging needs or circumstances in the society. Thank you, Drakan. The next question goes to Andreas. 
I've read a lot of articles on innovation in Jungberg and in Phil Salsar Jungberg. And in that literature, they talk about talk about innovation being made by unconventional, creative, or even authentic personalities. And these personalities create new solutions to new and old problems. And uh, some people would say that youth workers are really creative and some, sometimes they are unco unconventional. So based on your studies, how does, how does innovation happen in youth work and how innovating are youth workers? <laughs> um, I mean, you know, I'm, I might be the, the odd one out now to say uh, innovation doesn't happen all the time everywhere in youth work. Um, youth work is very often very hard daily business um, in which youth workers are constrained by a lack of resources, a lack of funds, are concentrating on very important one-to-one um, -one work with young people um, and don't have the time, the environment, the network, um, the multiple resources that you need to create innovation. And that is um, not a situation that we should be willing to accept. And I think it's a very easy way out for um, a lot of people with political and decision-making responsibility to say, yeah, young people are always creative, youth work is always creative. Yes, we are, and the sector is, but very often because the conditions force them to, and creativity and innovation out of a lack of resources should be nothing that we accept as a standard. On the contrary, what we should be doing is provide sufficient resources so that innovation can indeed become novel and is not our daily business of having to create it um, because we are forced to uh, do the work that we do with young people with uh, insufficient resources. So there are triggers and constraints in your effort. Uh, I remind you that you can ask questions on Mentimeter and on, on Facebook. They have a really interesting question on on Mentimeter, and I will first throw it to Federica, and then Dragan and Andreas can, can take up if you want to. And the question is like this, how brave do you workers have to be in order to be innovative, especially when the current political climate is so conservative? I think it's a super interesting question. I would also say how much also the organization should be brave to support youth worker, no? Because I think that, uh, it's something that we also goes with the trigger and the condition. Of course, uh, youth worker should be brave, but also need to to be sustained. Huh? Because uh, I don't. This was very interesting in the research, in which uh, a lot of things that it came out was exactly as was Andreas was saying now. So there is a level of creativity that a lot of youth workers has to use because they need to face difficult condition, uh, lack of resources. But then, how we go from this creativity to sustainable and change? approaches that really can change something at local level no so and this this for me is really linked also to the need to not just to have a youth to have a youth worker single but youth work as a field as a structure um coherent and linked and building bridges and building also com capacity to work and to act together because i was really very it was really very interesting to the what the five reasons to innovation and one thing is really to sustain a structure to sustain each other in the field to create innovation because again innovation in our field is value based so it's not something that we do just to do something new something brilliant something glamour but it's to do something that has an impact so i strongly believe that is a uh, is a systemic change it's not just once that we do something nice and i pass in the floor to my colleagues yeah. So in your study, you talk about ecosystem for innovation, which is about organizations and, and uh, civil society and governments and even in the European level. Uh, how would you respond to that question, Dragan? Yeah, thank you, Tommy. I, I actually think it's very important, this uh, issue of bravery, because what we saw from the study was that youth workers having an innovative mindset uh, was more appreciated, more valued, seen as more important than having skill set and competences. And having innovative mindset, you know, it's very general, but it includes everything from having an open mind, free spirit, being prepared to experiment, to try and to fail, and then being flexible, etc. But then the question is, how do you develop and how do you sustain, as Federica was saying, how do you tr uh, 
nurture that kind of innovative mindset. And I think here a great part of the job is on the organization. So the organizations are the ones that need to provide the frame and the space and the safety net uh, and the opportunity to experiment and to fail without having consequences. Even though to, to that, we should also tie the, the, uh, the, the way policymakers and donors approach, uh, approach the work in this field. And going back to Andres, Andreas, what he was saying about um, donors being uh, flexible and providing um, providing funding that is not really tied to to concrete uh, to concrete outcomes and to concrete indicators to provide that kind of uh, free space so that youth workers would indeed be able to be brave and, and open minded and free spirited. How about you, Andreas? What would you want to comment? Um... I think the question that I ask myself is how can we help youth workers across Europe having to be less brave? Because I think it's a little bit crazy that we expect bravery and that um, and that youth work needs to be brave in, in light of political developments. And I think one way in which we already do that and have become maybe more um, uh, conscious and decisive in doing that is in European youth work projects where we can help youth workers and youth work organizations in particular countries where that kind of bravery is uh, is needed um, to develop that bravery in a framework of international and European cooperation, which uh, I think oftentimes make it, makes it easier and provides a level of support um, and a level of backbone and a level of safety and a safety net that is very, very much needed for um, situations and contexts in which bravery is a standard, a standard requirement for youth work. Especially in the business literature or innovation, they talk about innovation policies, which mean that governments create conditions for, or that basically that can, innovations can happen. And then we need also <clears throat> civil society, which creates a mindset that favors, for, for example, entrepreneurialism and, and so on. So what about uh, Andreas' fifth, Andreas's fifth point was about creating conditions for innovation. So in your opinion, this is to all of you, how can governments support youth work innovation? What type of policy processes would be needed? And any one of you can be the first one. <laughs> Everybody um, shying away. Dragon, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I guess, uh, no, I think it came actually very, very clearly from from our study, and it had to do most with funding, not with the with the amount that is provided, but in the way in which funding is provided. So, what youth workers said that is hindering innovation is when funding is tied to specific outcomes, so that there is no opportunity, no space there to risk and to do something differently, because you are constantly under the pressure that maybe you won't be able to meet those those indicators and the outcomes that were prescribed to you from, from the beginning. So um, what we see as crucial for creating conditions for, for innovation is maybe not so much the uh, really policies or, or any mechanisms to push for innovation because we, we saw that innovation can come naturally inspired by youth workers and young people themselves. But what needs to be created is this safe space and uh, in which uh, youth workers can experiment. And this requires really uh, providing uh, more flexible, more long-term funding uh, uh, opportunities for, for organizations and youth workers. There's a question on the Mentimeter, and this, I guess, could go to Andreas or Federica. Welcome back, Federica. Uh, it states, what role does education and training have in developing an innovative mindset or capacity for innovation in your work, obviously? If you want, I can just drop one, one thirty. Oh, in, um, I, I think that education and training has a big role huh, in developing innovation mindset. I think one of the one of the points that we raised that uh, would be very interesting to develop further us in our research is how to develop competences innovation. So means that some organizations are also asking to the youth worker to be more innovative. But then the question is, what does it mean? You know, as we said before, innovation is not something that's coming from sky. Needed to develop competences, being able to read the unmet needs, for example, of young people to go through also finding new ways to give answers to the social challenges. So for sure, 
uh, the role of education and training in developing innovation is very important. And also, how do we do this training? If we use innovative methodology, if allow more creativity in, uh, in education, this is also a way to create a new change in the mindset, not only of youth workers, but also young people and general citizens. Well, Andreas, we have talked about how youth work is funded, and we have talked about training and education, which are the two most common ones. Uh, do you want to add something to this discussion? <laughs> well, I will now come out of the woods with a very surprising addition, um, because what we do, of course, need to complement a different funding landscape, which I'm very happy to say and the European youth programs are trying to move towards with um, with approaches that, you know, guarantee more long term funding and annual budgets that can then be negotiated within that framework. So that's actually very, very cool to also put, you know, to also put some price out where it belongs. Um, and that's cool to see more of that, please, and more of that in other spaces and arenas. Um, and training and education, but what we also need is um, is is good research, is uh, is a good evidence base on where our sector needs to move forward, where our sector continuously and repeatedly gets stuck, because um, the uh, the 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 youth worker, I mean, of course, the youth worker doesn't exist, but any youth worker and any youth worker organization in their particular context do not have the resources, unfortunately, to conduct substantive research on needs for innovation themselves. So work that um, Federica and Dragan have done in the context of the European Academy on Youth Work, work that we have done in the context of Ray is, I think, very much crucial on steering the sector in certain directions and providing, uh, providing some uh, uh, some landmarks and signposts of, of where we should go. And now Tommy has disappeared. <laughs> uh, that's innovative. Uh, that's an that's an innovative <laughs> format for the youth research dialogue. The the moderator cuts his internet connection. Uh, I I think he he may have a surprise for us in store. No, I hear no. he is back. Tommy, I'm, good. Oh, I, I'm back here. Sorry, I I screwed up. I pushed the wrong button. I can't no play problem. watching. I have to play myself. <laughs> but, uh, let's end on the, on the positive note. So shortly, Federica, you have one minute. Uh, can you say what type of organization are successful in promoting innovation in Europe? What so, are you really good at? What do we know already? We know that um, that are we analyze two different organizations. No? We analyze horizontal organization that's uh, in a way that are more the one more um, linked huh, to the young people. You no, know? they are working more directly with young people. They know directly their needs. Uh, they work a lot based on their uh, the feedback huh, coming from the wider community. But normally these horizontal organizations are the ones that are small less, the ones that are struggling so much with these sustainable fundings. And they don't have competences, for example, to assist, to, to really access to the big grants that really can make them an upscale of their way of working. To the other side, we had analyzed this hierarchical organization, oh, the biggest one, the one that has more funds, more grants, they have long and stable also structure, that sometimes they run big projects, but they, la they lack uh, direct contact or this kind of taste huh, that on, on with young people directly. So I, I think these are the two you know, opposites. So what, what we know about uh, that, that we would like to investigate more, this is one thing that we would like to go more in discuss, in analyzing, is uh, the, yeah, the impact of uh, the structure of the organization in doing innovation, which kind of competences should be needed, and how we can support also organization in developed the internal uh, competences who really assess to, to these big grants, as we said. And another thing that would be interesting to analyze is that uh, organizations that are in bigger community or the ones that are in rural areas or in peripheral areas, we analyze that there is different ways no? So, of course, who has in the big cities and the bigger community, they have access to a, a panorama or different uh, uh, 
uh, also input about innovation, but sometimes they have too many, too many, there are too many offers, and there is really difficult also to have an input to the local community or to get grants. Rather than in a small community, maybe it's less is less. Um, there are less resources, but less, but more opportunity to develop networking and to develop a, a new project that would have a direct direct input. So I think this is a, a new thing that would be very interesting to analyze in terms of uh, a part of this ecosystem that the Dragon was mentioning before. This positive note is a really good way of ending our our dialogue today. Thank you. It's been wonderful and I would have liked to continue. Please, uh, to the note to the audience, please do check out uh, the research paper that, that will come up soon by Federica and, and, and Rakan and Michel Ancelo, and also follow Ray research. And that positive note is also a good way of ending, ending the last Ray Youth Research Dialogue for this year. Uh, Carmen already said that we have good news. We will continue our thematic online series of evidence-based youth research findings in 2022. Check out the Ray website and the social media pages for updates. And we are happy if you join us in next year when we are discussing new youth research and youth policy issues with, with interesting guest speakers. So bye for this year. <laughs>